In our last broadcast about the Walt Disney Studios, we took you behind the scenes and showed you a group of artists whom you never see on the screen, yet whose work is reflected in the delightful animated pictures we all enjoy. Well, this time we're going to talk about another group of people on the Disney lot, whom you never see but only hear. Now that Walt's going into pictures with real life people, that situation is changing, but we'll talk about that later. The Disney Studios are different from any other Hollywood studio. Not because of the type of work they do, but rather in spite of it. There's none of the slightly unreal atmosphere of the usual studio. This is a thoroughly human place. From the moment you walk through the huge entrance gates towards the low white blocks of studio buildings, you become part of a friendly, closely integrated group of workers. From the gatekeeper to the boss himself, everyone seems pleased to see you. And you have only to talk to anyone for a couple of minutes to realize that the reason for it all is Walt Disney himself. The whole studio is simply an extension of his personality. Everyone in the studio calls him Walt, and you feel that they're really talking about a personal friend. They'll tell you he's the hardest working man around the place. He knows everyone's job, and is always ready with ideas that help out at critical moments. He may be having trouble with a new Alice in Wonderland sequence, but he'll stop a distribution expert in the corridor with a suggestion for the placing of Bambi down in Ecuador. I'm quite sure that if the car park attendant couldn't work out how to fit all the cars into convenient places, he'd yell for Walt, and the problem would be solved. No one quite knows how he does it. They just accept the miracle gratefully. And miracle it is, for producing a Disney cartoon is probably the most complicated, highly specialized job in Filmland. Perhaps the best way to explain it would be to speak to some of the key men in the production line. Well, the first thing, of course, in any film is the script. So I went looking for a scriptwriter. But there really isn't such a person in the Disney organization. Instead, I was shown a room whose four walls were literally covered with hundreds of sketches of fanciful Disney-type characters. In this room were two rather strange fellows going through a most intriguing routine. One of these bright young men was doing what appeared to be a combination Highland Fling and Conga, while the other was frantically dashing off sketch after sketch, obviously trying to capture the antics of his companion. I couldn't understand this at all, so I interrupted to ask Homer Brightman, one of the artists, for an explanation. What is going on, Homer? Well, to begin with, you've really hurt our feelings, because the dance that Harry Reeves, my teammate, was doing was neither the Highland Fling nor the Conga. It was a Brazilian samba. Oh. Yes, and you've no idea how much time I spent learning those tricky Brazilian steps. We were just doing our best to get them on paper for a new picture. You mean to say that you developed the story with pictures instead of words? Right. We discovered earlier in the game that we could best establish our characters and outline their actions through sketches. This makes it easier to visualize the story we're putting across. Once these sketches have been approved, we have them photographed and sent around the studio. And they become the working script used down the entire production line. Well, tell me, Homer, where do you fellows get your story ideas? Well, you see, the actual beginning of an idea for a feature starts with Walt. In a short production, it might be the pet brainchild of one of the story men, who has always wanted to see Donald Duck as a Northwest Mountie. <laughs> it might be the result of idle chatter. It's always a collaborative thing. I may get an idea, and we'll start talking and outline it. Then Homer may get a good gag. I'll top it. Then Homer will come back and top my gag. I'll go him one better. This is what we call building. We sketch our ideas up as we go along until in a short time, our board has a rough illustrated story on it. And the day always comes along when we're up against a blank wall, fresh out of ideas. What do you do then? Call Walt. He's a human dynamo, has more ideas than anyone else in the plant. He also acts as a spark plug for us. He stimulates our thinking and brings out ideas we, we never knew we even had before. How do you go about tying together these rough sketches into some kind of a working script? Well, the whole business is a cooperative enterprise. After Harry and I whip our ideas into some sort of shape, a meeting is arranged with a lot of other fellows, sparked by Walt. At this meeting, Harry and I do our darndest to sell our story to Walt. We macked out a couple of sequences in the picture. Well, you certainly were putting on a very fine performance when I walked in. And if you can get some of that humor into your sketches, you'll have a very good story. Whom do you suggest I talk to next? 
uh, why don't you hunt up one of our layout men? They take our scripts and translate them into workable patterns for various different artists and technicians to follow. Thanks for the suggestion, and also for these most interesting revelations. Well, not at all. Now I guess, Homer, that you and I will go back and interact again. Following this very excellent suggestion, I looked around the Disney lot for a layout man and was pleasantly surprised to find that one of Walt's leading artists in this field is an Australian named Ken O'Connor. Ken originally came from Perth and was a commercial artist in Melbourne and Sydney. He also did cartoons for various Australian papers. When did you leave Australia, Ken? It was back in 1930. That is a long time ago. Do you have any relatives there still? Quite a number, including my brother Noel, who is now an architect in Melbourne. Did you find that the commercial artwork you did in Australia helped you in your work here at the Disney Studios? Most certainly. After all, there is a similar approach to both mediums. A commercial artist's job is to sell a product, and a Disney layout man's function is to sell the animated cartoon acting and the mood of the picture. I must confess I've been using this term layout artist quite freely without being exactly certain of its meaning. Perhaps you could explain it more fully. Well, the layout man acts as a hyphen between the story department on the one hand and the animation and background departments on the other. A Disney layout man might be compared with a set designer of a live action studio or a legitimate theater. His drawings set the stage for a picture and indicate the path of action a character will follow. Well, I can see that you're doing black and white work now. Do you decide the color too? Definitely, yes. The layout man's main concern is with the appearance of the picture, so he tries to heighten the legibility and mood of each sequence by searching out the most effective color combinations. Does that mean that you do the final paintings? No. The final paintings are done by the background department. The layout man also determines colors for our animated stars like Donald Duck or Dumbo or Bambi. These colors must not clash with the backgrounds, nor can the backgrounds outdazzle the characters. In this sense, you might think of a layout man as a costume designer. Does he have anything to do with the photography? Yes, although he may rarely set foot inside the camera department. He plans camera angles and camera moves and determines the proper perspective of the setting and the characters that will appear in each scene. He also figures out how the sets are to be lighted. Layout certainly sounds like a full-time job. Do you ever have any fun? All the time. It's the constant surprises you get into in this land of fantasy. You never know whether you'll be called upon to plan the action for a herd of pink elephants in a picture like Dumbo, or a mighty monster of the deep like Willy the Whale in Make Mine Music. I can see why that would be quite fascinating. Thanks a lot, Ken, for your explanation of what a layout artist does at the Walt Disney Studios. I hope I've helped, and it certainly was most enjoyable to talk to a fellow Australian. Thank you very much. Now that we've seen how the stories are created at the Disney Studios and the layouts and backgrounds built for the action, I think it's time we called upon one of the people who are responsible for the drawing of the Disney stars, whom we all see and love on the screen. One of Walt's veteran animators, as they are called, is a genial fellow by the name of Eric Larson, who has been with Walt for over a dozen years. Hello, Miss Jackson. How do you do, Eric? I hope you don't mind being called away from your drawing board. Not at all. I've been working on a scene with Jiminy Cricket, and the little rascal is such a gad about, he's got me plumb tired out. You mean Jiminy Cricket from Pinocchio? Is he going to be in another Disney feature? Yes, he is. As a sort of master of ceremonies in a feature which we call fun and fancy free. Tell me, Eric, what are the responsibilities of an animator? An animator has to bring the characters to life, so to speak. He takes the story suggestions and the action planned by the director and layout man and transforms them into drawings that move and breathe life into what so far have only been inanimate ideas. You said you were doing Jiminy Cricket. What determines what character you're assigned to draw? An animator, just like a star in a live action picture, is cast in a cartoon picture. Some of us, for example, are better at interpreting characters like Dopey and Grumpy than others. So we are put on that type of picture. Others are best at drawing characters like Pluto. They are naturally assigned to draw the broad type of character. What was your favorite character? Well, that's hard to say. I kind of liked Thumper, the rabbit and Bambi. And then there was lots of fun in drawing both Sasha the bird and Sonia the duck in the Peter and the Wolf sequence of Make Mine Music. 
They were rather wonderful. When does your work on such characters begin? Right in the early stages, in story conferences. We like to get as many viewpoints as we can as to the action we're going to have to animate. We like to start early to work out little tricks or bits of business to be put in the sequence. We have many meetings with the directors, with story men, layout artists, and with Walt, ironing out such things as gags, staging, cuts, dialogue, general attitude, and mood. These conferences must be awfully important. They are, and they are a great help to us. We even have conferences with ourselves. Are you saying you talk to yourself? Well, not exactly. We sit down at our drawing boards and plan out the scene, going over the action still more detailed than has been, been done heretofore, and figuring out all the small bits of action, such as the way a character will take off his hat, or close a door, or, in short, make him live. When does the actual animation start? That starts when we make a series of set expressive drawings for the scene. We make about two or three of these drawings for each foot of film in our scenes. And usually a foot of film has about 16 drawings in it. These key drawings will set the positions of the character against the layout and establish the mood and feeling of the character. I've noticed that when the final drawings are seen on the screen, the lines are sharp and definite. That must take a lot of time. It does, but that comes after we're finished. We work in a rough, sketchy sort of way, not being definite or cramped about our lines, to get as much life and movement into our drawings as possible. Other men clean up and fill in the in-between drawings later. Well, what are the qualifications for a chief animator? Any number of things besides the general ability to make funny drawings. An animator should have something of the actor in him. Naturally, he should know a lot about composition and staging, and it's also good if he knows something about music. You'd be surprised at the number of times in a Disney picture he's called upon to interpret music like, uh, oh, for instance, in Make Mine Music and Fantasia. How do these animation drawings reach the screen? After they have been okayed and all of the cleaned up and in-between drawings made, they are sent over to the inking and painting department. There, a group of trained girls trace them on sheets of transparent celluloid, and another group applies rich colors on the reverse side of these sheets. These, in turn, are placed on watercolored or oil backgrounds made from the layouts you discussed with Ken O'Connor, and then photographed, one at a time, by a still camera. That's all there is to it. Sounds simple when you explain it, but I know its simplicity lies in the imagination and technical skill which you and the other artists here at the Disney lot have developed through the years. Thanks a lot, Eric. You're welcome, and it was a pleasure to meet you. By this time, I had heard so much about Walt that when I finally met the man who was responsible for this whole industry, it was like greeting an old friend. I just walked up to him and said, Hello, Walt. Hello, Miss Jackson. Have you been enjoying your trip through the studio? Indeed, I have. I never realized the amount of detail and technical skill required to produce one of your pictures. How you people can lick such painstaking technicalities and still maintain a breath of freshness and originality is a mystery to me. It leaves me slightly confused. <laughs> well, don't let it worry you. You know, we've been at this business for a long time, and every day something new comes up to baffle us. But as long as we can get a few laughs out of it, we're happy. Speaking of something new, I saw a little bit of your new picture, Song of the South, today. That combination of live action and animation is most interesting. It's a new development, isn't it? Yes, although we've been experimenting with this combination for a long time. It looks as if uh, we finally succeeded in Song of the South. Well, how did it come about? Well, I've always had a conviction that by combining live actors with animated cartoons, we could make the technique of filmmaking practically limitless. You see, I've always believed that the world is half actual and half fantasy. In other words, that we live in our imagination as much as we do in the world around us. That's right. The dream world can't be photographed with real people, nor can cartoons give the total impression of reality. So why not put them together? Exactly. Do you plan to use this new technique in other pictures? Well, we're just finishing a picture called How Dear to My Heart that is mostly live action. It's the story of a little boy's love for a black lamb. And we have our sweetheart team, Luana Patton and Bobby Driscoll, making their second appearance. Then we're working on a treatment of Peter Pan, Alice in Wonderland. I see. You'll have a real Alice, and then the fantastic people in the land beyond the looking glass will be animated. That's right. I understand that Edgar Bergen is going to appear in one of your features. Yes, Edgar, along with his little pal Charlie McCarthy and Mortimer Sturd, <laughs> Snurd, <laughs> <laughs> work with Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, and Goofy in their particular version of Jack and the Beanstalk. This story is tied in with another one that Dinah Shore sings and tells about a little circus bear named Bongo, 
who falls in love with a little hillbilly bear named Lulabell. <laughs> Both stories are combined into one feature titled Fun and Fancy Free. That sounds like a full program. What's this about your going to Ireland? Oh, yes. I plan to spend a little, a little time there. I'm going to study the Irish music and the folklore, and particularly the tales about the leper horns. I've got a feature in mind that I'm based on the pranks of these little people. It would be wonderful if you could make a trip to Australia. Oh, I'd certainly like to. I believe there's an abundance of material in Australia. I know in my rambling through South America that I picked up a lot of material that I'm still using. You know, we've done a few things about Australia already. What was that? <laughs> well, it's about two uh, wallabies we had here in the studio. Oh, I know. It was sent to us, and we made one called, uh, oh, it was Mickey and the Kangaroo. Do you still have the wallabies? No, I had to get rid of them. They ate up all the shrubs and everything else, and I finally turned them over to the zoo. Well, maybe that's the best place for them. Well, anyhow, I'm sure there's lots more material down there in which, which we could use. There certainly is. And I know all of us in Australia could think of nothing better than to have Walt Disney bring some of our features to the screen. So I'll say goodbye, in the hope that such a day will not be too far off. Thank you for the privilege of meeting you and seeing what's behind the scenes of your wonderful studio. Well, it was nice meeting you, and bon voyage. Thank you.